Pygmies and Gentle Sores, Mesozoic Maniacs and Dinosaur Dorks. Welcome to Assessing Survival, the series where we take animals, people, and fictional creatures and place them in different periods throughout history as well as some places in fiction. You guys voted and in today's video we will be placing the killer whale into the Mesozoic. If you'd like to be a part of deciding what the next video will be about, subscribe and don't forget to keep an eye on the community tab of the channel. Polls are normally posted a few days after the video is uploaded. Just like in our previous episodes, before we put our subjects into the Mesozoic, we have to determine what period and time frame of the Mesozoic we'll be putting our orcas into. Not only to see where they'll be best suited for the environment, but also to see what ecosystem would be the most interesting to speculate on. We're going to start with the Triassic period. The Triassic period really set the stage for aquatic ecosystems for the rest of time. Animals like ichthyosaurs, nothosaurus, and early plesiosaurs carved the path for animals that had adapted on land to make their way back into the water. Tenmodontosaurus, a predatory ichthyosaur, was roughly the same size as an orca and fed on most anything it could, but it wasn't really adapted for hunting larger prey like Shonisaurus or Shostasaurus. These animals, as adults, as far as we know, don't have any predators other than maybe each other. In my opinion, in terms of the trophic systems, orcas would absolutely clean house. The only real threat comes from Tenmodontosaurus, which likely wouldn't even attack orcas once they figure out their pod animals. The supercontinent Pangaea made it harder for the ocean to be as diverse as it is today. Coastal waters and reefs really only existed around the perimeter of the continent, creating more than 16,000 miles of open, desolate ocean. Like I normally bring up in previous episodes, the Triassic was really hot. Ocean temperatures averaged about 40 degrees Celsius, which is hotter than the hottest parts of our oceans like the Persian Gulf and Inner Gulf of Mexico, which orcas today tend to stay away from. However, orcas are pretty adaptable, and maybe after a generation or two, they could become much leaner to compensate for higher temperatures. I believe orcas would do too well in the Triassic. The ecosystem is pretty much entirely different from their current environment, and likely isn't able to support a hyperactive predator like the killer whale. The Jurassic Period the Jurassic continues the trend of the development and diversification of marine reptiles in the ocean. In the Jurassic, we see plesiosaurs and pliosaurs take over the role of apex predators in the oceans over ichthyosaurs. There is a lot of debate on just how big pliosaurs actually became in the Jurassic. Most solid estimate we have for the largest pliosaur is Pliosaurus funci, which is estimated to reach just about 12.5 meters or 42 feet at upper estimates. When put against an average orca, 23 to 27 feet, this really isn't all that impressive, especially considering orcas hunt whales much larger than themselves on a regular basis. So despite their size and ferocious appearance, many of the top predators of the Jurassic Oceans would be easy meals for orcas. The Jurassic was much more biodiverse and had a more suitable temperature for orcas than the Triassic, but honestly, I think the Jurassic would be a boring place to put them. I think it would just be too easy for them. The Cretaceous Period The Cretaceous is the most well-documented and as far as we know, most diverse aquatic ecosystem System of all the Mesozoic. It will also be the most challenging for orcas because of the advent of predators like Mosasaurs. Ocean surface temperatures in the Cretaceous were pretty uniformly averaged around 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. Though still pretty hot, this is much better than the Triassic. The Cretaceous also has a lot more areas the orca can thrive in as opposed to the Triassic. If we look at a map of the globe in the Cretaceous, it's more or less just like our map but with much higher water levels. This means a lot more coastal waters and reefs where marine life tends to thrive. For these reasons, I believe the Cretaceous would be the most interesting in the most familiar era to place them in. We'll be taking a breeding population of orcas, which I'm estimating to be about 8 pods of 5 to 10 individuals and dispersing them throughout the oceans of the Cretaceous globe. This is the first assessing survival, and maybe the only one, where we'll actually be handicapping the subject animal. Our subject orcas will be the smallest known variant of orca whales, and that is the offshore orca whale, whose maximum length tends to be 22 feet. I'll be using 5 different categories to assess the orca's ability to survive. These categories will then be added up for a final assessment score. These categories are environment suitability, advantages, disadvantages, food sources, and competition, as well as a section at the end of the video where we speculate how they might evolve and adapt to their environment going forward. So without any further ado, let's get into the categories. Environment suitability. Now we mostly went over this, but I'd like to reiterate that orcas will be perfectly comfortable living in the Cretaceous Ocean. Killer whales inhabit all parts of the ocean, excluding very deep open ocean and particularly hot areas. Orcas that inhabit the polar regions are even known to quote unquote vacation to tropical regions during the coldest times of the year. So moving our orcas to the Cretaceous period will essentially be like your grandparents in Colorado moving to Florida. Environment suitability, 5 out of 5. Advantages. Now, orcas have a plethora of advantages for us to go over, so this is going to take a minute. The first advantage is their size. Orcas, even on the smaller end, are quite large. The offshore orcas in the North Pacific are on average 21 feet 
or six and a half meters long and can weigh anywhere between 65 to 12,000 pounds or three to 5,000 kilograms. This is a lot of weight to push around, especially in a group. That makes your average pot of orcas around 40 to 50,000 pounds of whale. Even when considering the sizes of all marine life in history, this is pretty big. Orca pods can consist of anywhere between 2 and 15 individual whales. In rarer cases, pods will consist of almost 200 individuals, typically for temporary social interaction, mating, or seasonal availability of food. This is in contrast to the predators of the late Cretaceous, who, as far as we know, didn't live in any type of social group at all, and if they did, it wasn't nearly this size. Another advantage is their intelligence. Orcas, dolphins, and cetaceans in general are without a doubt the most intelligent animals on the planet behind human beings. Orcas sport the second largest brain in the animal kingdom behind sperm whales. Orcas are known for their complex and coordinated hunting strategies. For instance, they work together to create waves that knock seals off of ice flows, herd fish into tight balls for more efficient feeding, flipping sharks over to knock them out, before eating specifically their liver, and when hunting larger cetaceans, they will often first attack the whale's fins and tail fluke to immobilize the whale. They are capable of teaching these things to younger orcas as well as other pots. We know this firsthand because there is an increasing number of orcas attacking and disabling boat rudders, meaning they're likely telling all their friends how to do it. Killer whales in South Africa specifically target the liver of great white sharks. We don't know why they do this, but presumably, Shark liver tastes very good to them. Orcas also use a sophisticated system of vocalization and echolocation to converse with each other. Orcas are also very emotionally intelligent. They are very tuned into the feelings of their fellow pod members as well as other animals. Okay, that's as much as you're going to get out of me for their intelligence. Food sources. To put it simply, everything is on the menu for the killer whale. There's no animal in the oceans of the Cretaceous that I don't see orcas being able to take down. But let's go over some of these prey items and figure out what might be their prey of choice. Ammonites, plesiosaurs, fish, sharks, seabirds, smaller mosasaurs, and sea turtles. Put it simply, orcas will have a field day with sea life of the Cretaceous. None of these animals I just mentioned have any chance of fighting back against a pod of orcas. Just like orcas today, I imagine that orcas in the Cretaceous would also have their own preferred prey from pod to pod and individual to individual. Some pods may prefer to hunt ammonites and sharks, while others may prefer going after marine reptiles. Food sources, 4.5 out of 5. Disadvantages. Now, there's a reason I saved disadvantages for after the food sources category. This is because orcas have an incredibly high metabolism and appetite. Your average orca will eat almost 300 pounds of food per day. That's hundreds of thousands of calories on a daily basis. Now, the reason I see this as a disadvantage is because we don't know if the Cretaceous Ocean can support an appetite of this magnitude, as even predators like Mosasaurus likely only needed to eat half as much as a single orca, as they are reptiles and have much slower metabolisms. My concern for the orcas in the Cretaceous is that they may very well overhunt and end up inadvertently starving themselves and disrupting the ecosystem. Another disadvantage they have is maturation and gestation. Orca whales take on average 17 months to gestate in their mother's womb, and reach reproductive maturity anywhere between 8 and 13 years continuing to grow for 25 years. Females can only give birth to a single calf, and will often wait 3 to 5 years before mating again, but can wait as much as 10 years. Mammals in general take much longer than birds and reptiles to grow. Mosasaurs and plesiosaurs also gave live birth, but likely gave birth to more than one individual. They also likely matured much faster. Disadvantages, 4 out of 5. Now for the competition category. There are three large predators that come to mind in the late Cretaceous oceans. The first one is Elasmosaurus. Elasmosaurus is a sizable plesiosaur, reaching almost 43 feet at higher estimates. But most of this length is of course in its neck. This marine reptile is very well adapted for hunting and eating fish. Their small, unassuming heads are hypothesized to trick their prey into thinking they are much smaller than they really are. The neck of an Elasmosaurus is a serious weak point, and with a bite force on par with that of saltwater crocodiles, an orca could easily snap the neck of these animals and instantly kill them. Though plesiosaurs likely cared for their young and lived in family groups, they're just too vulnerable to something like an orca. The second animal is Cretoxyrhina. Coming in at 26 feet, this shark is a very formidable predator. Bigger than our average orca, taking one of these sharks down could be a challenge for an individual orca, but not a pod. However, there are a number of sharks that tend to live together in groups for safety and ease of feeding though they lack the social cohesion of marine mammals. Even great whites have recently been observed traveling across the Atlantic in a group, which pretty much goes against everything we knew about them previously. If Cretoxyrhina lives and travels in groups like modern sharks, they could genuinely give orcas a reason for pause. Do I think if we were to put them in an arena and force them to fight that they would come close to winning against orcas? No. Chances are, if orcas wanted to eat a Cretoxyrhina, they would isolate it from the larger group and gang up on it to take it down. However, this is still a dangerous predator, 
and the orcas will have to be careful about how they dispatch them. I think our orca whales would sooner go after easier prey than approach a group of these sharks. But if the other options are slim, the Cretoxy rhino remains a possible meal. And last but certainly not least is Mosasaurus hoffmani, coming in at an average of 42 feet long. Hoffman's Mosasaur was the apex predator of the Cretaceous Ocean. This ambush predator dominated its ecosystem by feeding on ammonites, fish, plesiosaurs, and other mosasaurs. However, when orcas are added into the mix, this massive reptile may no longer be the top dog. Orca whales are more than capable of taking down even blue whales with enough pod members and effort. Even at its higher estimates of 57 feet long, Mosasaurus simply doesn't have the size and power to deter a pod of orcas. Though let's not count the reptile out just yet. Let's go over exactly why Hoffman's Mosasaur was so successful in its environment. The hunting behavior of this Mosasaur was likely similar to that of modern crocodiles. This animal would sit in darker waters in the depths and quickly accelerate up to 30 miles an hour in a sudden burst of speed and catch their prey by surprise. They likely couldn't sustain these speeds for very long. Even if they were warm-blooded reptiles, their metabolism weren't as complex as that of orcas. Maintaining high speeds for more than a few minutes would burn an incredible amount of energy that the Mosasaurus just doesn't have. A pod of orcas could easily run down and tire these marine reptiles and take them out. But like the Cretoxy rhina, this is still an incredibly dangerous predator and could very suddenly dispatch an orca in a sudden burst of speed and power. Mosasaurus had an estimated bite force of around 13,000 to 16,000 pounds per square inch. This is definitely enough to kill an orca pretty quickly. Orcas have strong bonds with their pod members, and once they realize the danger of hunting a Hoffman's Mosasaur, I think they would sooner steer clear of these marine reptiles than risk losing a member of their pod. Orcas will most assuredly go after younger and smaller Mosasaurs, but an adult Mosasaurus Hoffman eye is not worth the risk. Competition 4.5 out of 5. Final assessment score is 9.2 out of 10. This should come as no surprise. Orca whales are the epitome of an aquatic predator. No animal is better adapted for dominating the ocean than these cetaceans, but in the Cretaceous they could be too much for their new environment. Though it's more likely that the animals around them would evolve to compensate for their disruption of the environment, let's speculate on how orcas may evolve and change to better balance this new trophic system. Just for fun. Speculative evolution. Bigger isn't always better. Orsinus tachyoptera, the swift-winged orca, or Dalkas for short. In just a couple million years leading up to the KT extinction, our original population of orcas has become much smaller to compensate for their extreme appetites, allowing them to maintain their lifestyle without decimating the ecosystem. They resemble a mix of bottlenose dolphins and belugas while maintaining their unique pattern. Falcas no longer hunt such prey like Elasmosaurus and Mosasaurus, but rather, they mostly eat ammonites, fish, and smaller marine reptiles. Their teeth have become much more blunt and sturdy to allow them to easily crack open the shells of ammonites and mollusks. The average dalka comes in at a weight of 1300 pounds and a length of 12 feet. The intelligence of these animals has remained proportionate to their body size, meaning they are just as intelligent if not more. An interesting aspect of their behavior as a result of this is the use of tools. Dalkas use the shells of other creatures as weapons, toys, and shovels. They use the flatter shells for shoveling through sand, oftentimes to find mollusks or just to have fun. They use sharper, pointier shells, like those of the Lemnites, almost like a sword punch for their snout. Dalkas will use this against larger predators like Mosasaurus, have better chances in an encounter with them, but will also use them in encounters with other descendants of orcas. Which brings us to our next speculative evolution. Maybe bigger is better. Venetracinus solus, the lone hunting orca, or the venator whale for short. Another way our orcas could evolve to fit a niche more balanced with their ecosystem is foregoing their large pods. The venator whale has evolved to live a lifestyle that's a mix of sperm whales and their reptilian contemporaries, the mosasaur. While females and calves continue to live in pods, though in much smaller numbers than orcas, bull males tend to live mostly solitary lifestyles. The venator whale has become quite a bit larger now that their kills are not shared among pod members. These large toothed whales reach lengths of 45 to 50 feet, or 14 to 15 meters. Not nearly as big as today's sperm whales, or the Miocene's Leviathan, but still on par with mosasaurs and much larger than orcas. These animals prefer hunting large marine reptiles like plesiosaurs and Hoffman's mosasaur, but also eat things like fish and ammonites when they can't find enough food. Sometimes they even prey on their cousins, the Dalka, though this isn't common. Their once massive dorsal fins have now slimmed down, as a whale of this size with such a massive dorsal fin would be very prone to being rolled over by strong currents. We observe this in sperm and blue whales today. This fin is likely to become much smaller as the years go on. They have also evolved a much larger sonar melon so that they can communicate with other whales and locate prey from a much greater distance. 
Much like sperm whales, these whales produce a clicking noise that is almost enough to rupture the eardrums of most creatures within a certain distance. These whales are very few and far between, often not running into another of their species for hundreds of miles. With the advent of the KT extinction, marine reptiles were all wiped out. We don't know exactly why the impact on the surface affected large marine life in the ocean in such a way, but our best guess is that the change in the atmosphere also affected the ocean acidifying it to an incredible degree, disrupting trophic systems from the bottom up, making it much harder for larger animals to survive. Luckily, the descendants of our more dolphin-sized Orsinus tachyoptera just barely scraped through to the Cenozoic era. But now, there are so many niches that are wide open and ready to be filled by our orcas. This, of course, will suspend the need for proto-cetaceans to evolve in the first place, because, paradoxically, their descendants have already done it. Big Boots to Fill Balenodontus orca The baleen tooth orca in both the Cretaceous and Paleogene, there are no large filter or suction feeding animals that we know of. There may have been something like a basking or whale shark, but nothing like today's baleen whales or the large ichthyosaurs of the Triassic. The descendants of the Dalkas go on to evolve to fill this empty niche. By the end of the Eocene, the first filter feeding descendants of orcas emerged. Balenodontus orca, or the baleen orca, is a filter slash suction feeding whale that has evolved convergently to our modern baleen whales, though their baleen plates are a bit more primitive and still in the works compared to our baleen whales. They have very short dorsal fins like modern whales, long powerful tails for efficient travel, as well as longer flippers like that of a humpback whale, which they use to defend themselves against predators. They weigh an astounding 100,000 pounds and reach a maximum length of 72 feet. And no, I didn't make it bigger than a blue whale, simply because every paleontologist and their dog wants to find the next biggest animal on Earth, and it's just not gonna happen. Respect Big Blue, baby. The baleen orca, of course, feeds on plankton, krill, and small fish. They have a large ventral pouch, which they use to suck up as much water and prey as possible, and expel the water while retaining the prey items. Unlike modern whales, the baleen orca has retained its sonar melon, allowing them to have unparalleled echolocation abilities. They also have retained their incredible intelligence and still live in large pods. They live in pods of anywhere between three and eight individuals. They have impressive emotional intelligence and are in tune with the feelings and needs of their pod members. They use their great intelligence and their large bodies to coordinate and push large pockets of krill into each other, making feeding much easier for the whole pod. With cetaceans arriving onto the scene in the Cenozoic much earlier than in our normal timeline, the ecosystem of the ocean is likely to change and evolve in a vastly different way. Perhaps cetaceans will occupy even more niches than they did before, or maybe they'll actually end up being less abundant. No matter how it goes though, I know everyone is going to have a whale of a time. Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode of Assessing Survival. If you liked the episode, be sure to click the like button and leave a comment about what you'd like to see next. Also, don't forget to subscribe and keep an eye on the community tab on the channel, or join the Discord and come chat with me and some other folks. Links for the Discord as well as the Patreon are in the description. I'll send you guys out with some 3D renderings of the bears from the speculative evolution section of the last video by Joseba, a very talented member of our Discord. See you next time.